Welcome back, Visions fans. Ready Player Will here. Today, I want to talk a little bit about the new Mastery Ability 2 upgrades for Fryevia and Zazan, Immortal Zazan, who are two global exclusive units. So a lot of us are really looking forward to their Mastery Abilities, and I figured this is a good opportunity for me to talk about the topic at large, give some additional thoughts. So kind of getting into things here, there's a few different types of MA2s, at least how I think of them. And the number one is to change a character. That's where you give them something that alters the profile of how they like essentially function. And those have to be drastic. A good example is Whisper with the innate five hate, where she was always a tank, but in the modern definition of War of the Visions, you really stopped being a tank if you didn't have innate hate or at least hate that you could generate on turn one. So by that metric, Whisper had kind of fallen off for tanking potential just in concept. This at least changes her character back to it. So that's one type. Another type is to address a deficiency in a character. It's something that has an age ball over time and actively holding them back. And I think the Victoria Mirage Barrier is a good example of this. She has no teammate buffs and an exceptional amount of mobility, which means she just kind of like oogabooga's forward into the battlefield with no way to like mitigate or survive oncoming damage as she outpaces her teammates. So this Mirage Barrier addresses this deficiency where she just kamikazes into the enemy and at least gives her one turn where she can mitigate some incoming damage to allow her teammates to catch up and let the flow of battle happen. Now, another type of MA2 is to make what they do even better materially. So now the Ayaka Limit Break, giving her a second cast of it, I actually think is a great example of this, where it's a massive insta-heal, theoretically great for a second Guild War attack or a second Guild War defend. It's her highest potency heal, and she's meant to be a heal bot. Well, then this certainly helps her do that. So that's a significant increase to what she was able to do otherwise. And then finally, the fourth kind, which is unfortunately, in my opinion, kind of the worst kind, is to update for power creep. And this one is just characters are old and in order to make them still feasibly usable, you have to update some of their stats to compete with the modern state of where stats are in the game. Now, there's nothing wrong with this. Obviously, it's welcome when they do this. The downside to this, though, is that it doesn't last. At least these other three tend to scale well over different kinds of metas, changes in the game. The problem with just updating stats for the sake of updating for power creep is that they're going to get power creeped again. So it's a real short-term solution that really doesn't change anything about the character other than maybe some short-term usage. And a good example of this is Lara's 15 evasion and her 25 crit damage. That does nothing to significantly change her character at all. You could argue that it does make her what she's supposed to do even better, so that kind of does overlap, but it really is an adjustment for power creep at the end of the day. Now, some considerations when we talk about master abilities too. Uh, not all of them are supposed to make characters meta or even usable, really. Uh, most of them aren't, actually. Most of them are just a way for Gumi to update the character to remain somewhat relatively competitive. And it's actually a well-designed concept, in my opinion. I actually genuinely like it, where it, it makes sure that characters are really truly seen as investments, if you will, over time, that you don't invest all these resources in a character to build them up to 120, but then you never get to use them again as the game goes on. I know Final Fantasy Brave x is the original, kind of has a massive problem with this, where every single week the characters just get better, and old characters are just unusable after a while forever. So although I might be harsh in some of my mastery ability reviews here in terms of my expectations, I'm actually very much applauding Gumi for it in the first place. I do think it's a great idea. But then finally, how do we define a good MA2? Now, when I do any of my reviews and I speak in, in generally, I always have to speak at things when they're at their maxed stress level to what Gumi's intended. It's really the only way you can compare things apples to apples. And so I'm sure there's some of you in the chat that use Fryavi a lot or Zazan a lot. You probably have great results with them. If that's the case, that's amazing. They just got even better for you. But we have to speak objectively when we compare characters. So that's what I'm going to try to attempt to do here. But in my opinion, I think the easiest definition for me, can I use them now more than before? And again, that's going to differ depending upon where your rank is and what you're trying to compete for. Because for some of you, the answer to this might be yes. But I feel like this is a good barometer to judge whether or not it's a good MA2 or not, whether it's valuable. Now, when we look at Fryavia, what kind of character is she? She's a magic type attack tank. It's important to distinguish that. She's not a magic tank. It's a magic type attack tank. Those are two different things. Now that we have attack types like Elena and Jaden that scale off different kinds of attack types, that obviously doesn't lean into what Fryavia does. Now, she's Paladin-esque with the White Mage sub-job. I actually kind of like the concept, even if the AI is difficult to manage. And she does lean a little bit more into that Brawler style, the idea being that the longer the fight goes on, the better they become, because she does have Spell Veal Blade, which increases her defense and spirit over the fight. That's, that's her profile currently. Now, what are her strengths? She tanks magic-type attacks exceptionally well. 
Now, she's really tuned to counter wind as well, which does give her relative value so long as wind has lots of value. Speaking quite frankly, though, that's really the end of it, though. That is her strength. She's kind of a one-trick pony. Doesn't really apply well to things other than that. Are there scenarios where maybe she can take on some other situations? If you do it right, maybe. But that's that's really the bread and butter. But when we look at her weaknesses, it's actually a pretty long list. Uh, hardly any utility on the main job, but she's a spell blade. She's got silence and poison if you want to consider those valuable utility. They're a little hit and miss. No innate defense in spirit, which is a huge mark of death for a tank, which leans into not great survivability against other attack types. Main buffs are dispellable, so her hate that she generates and the spell veal blade buffs are dispellable, so it does make her effectively useless at what she's supposed to do. And she quite honestly lacks the modern things needed to tank, so any kind of AoE or unit resistance, some kind of reliable protect and shell. She does have the abilities on the sub job, but they're not reliably castable. Regen, Courage, Debuff Resistance, she only has 12% on the passive. And she is very much reliant on her vision card to actually make her the character she's needed to be. That's not terribly unique that characters are elevated by their own vision cards. That's a pretty common thing, but hers definitively changes who she is. It gives her the innate hate. It gives her the 20% slash resistance to make up for the semi-weakness, if you will, for not having defense or spirit. And that can be a bad thing for flexibility when you're trying to make a team. Now, let's look at the actual MA2 itself, her original, was increasing HP 10% for self and magic resistance of 10% for self. What did they give her? So she gave her ice attack 15 for herself and ice allies, increase HP by 30%, increase magic resistance by 20%, and increase agility by 10%. It ends up being about 5 agility for her. Here's the problem with this. This was an MA2 for power creep. Ice attack 15 is not special. All characters nowadays have it, so that's not even a, an MA2 in my opinion. That's basically getting her to where all the rest of the characters should be. The second thing here, both of these second attributes are things she already had. They just increased them. She already had HP 10%, now it's 30%. She already had magic resistance 10, now it's 20. And while the HP is actually pretty significant, don't get me wrong, it's I think it's like seven or 800 HP, it's sizable. The magic resistance isn't as big as you might think because of how prevalent magic resistance penetration can be nowadays compared to when she was originally released. Well, you could make the case it makes her do the things she's supposed to do even better. I'm gonna argue that's not the case. I think this is distinctly more for power creep. And I'm actually giving it an F. I think it's a terrible MA2 upgrade. And by the fact that I don't think she's going to be used more than she already is. She's just not. She's got her situation where she's good at, and that's really it. Now, does nothing to address any of the deficiencies that we talked about for tanking the modern era war divisions. And one of them, which I didn't mention, but is part of it, she really doesn't do any damage at all, which is fine for a tank, but that's usually a trade-off for either A, more survivability, or B, for a lot of utility, which she kind of doesn't really do either exceptionally well. And I don't think it significantly makes her better at what she already does well. Objectively speaking, of course it does. More HP, more agility, more resistance. Objectively, the answer is true that it makes her better, but I don't think significantly so. So you're not going to get a lot of extra use in other applications of it. Now, what would I've liked to have seen, I actually think there are some things they could have done to make her a fair bit more usable. Now, number one, I think healing power 50 would have been a good one. Not only does that lean into the synergy with Velis in terms of getting a lot of healing power, but if you're going to increase her health pool, you also have to somehow increase the way that she receives healing or else she's just going to be a heal bot when she has Curata on herself and no external healing. She's already a heal bot when that's the case, but now you just made it even harder because she's never going to be near close to full. But if you're going to open her up to taking more damage, because there's no defense or spirit, you have to also at the same time make sure you can replenish that damage in some capacity, which they didn't. And not that this isn't powerful, but it's also pretty common to dispel this nowadays. Dark Fina has healing power down. Summer Jaden just releases healing power down 50. So it's not like this is uncounterable. It's very counterable. But I think another thing they could have done, 10 unit or AoE resistance. Nothing terribly significant. It's effectively the same thing as what they did for Mom with the 10% elemental resistance. It's net the same effect. But if you don't want to drastically change all her weapon type resistances or give her defense or spirit, I think this is totally fine to still help mitigate the incoming damage. I think another one, I think a track barrier upgraded should have had 50 debuff resistance. Because when we talk about survivability, being able to potentially ward off debuffs, which are like things like slash resistance down or light resistance down, those are big ways in which characters amplify their damage. And if you want to make her this kind of like beefier sustain tank without giving her a lot of resistances or defense or spirit, 
Well, then you can decrease the amount of times in which she would take that excess damage. So she's already got 12 from the passive. This would give her 50 from the buff. You could technically get 25 from the trust stones for some of those types of debuffs. And then her vision card is technically 40 debuff uh, resistance as well, which this would effectively make her so that you could not break her defense, which is awesome if she does no defense to begin with. I think that's like a valuable trade-off. So I think something in the range of these three would have been really valuable. What they did for her does nothing to make her more usable than she already is. So now let's get into Zazan. When we look at him, what kind of character is he? A high evasion unit with survivability. That's distinctly different than a lot of other evasion units who don't have as much survivability. And he does have defensive or physical tank busting potential. He's got a lot of defense penetration. Now, what are the good things about him? Uh, S tier evasion overall. He is amongst top of the charts. He is the bar, if you will, uh, by many standards. He does offer some utility with agility down 25%, healing power down 40, disable potential when attacking from behind. And he does have good mobility with move forward jump too. But we've talked about that. That's also sometimes a double-edged sword, and that very much is the case for him. What are his weaknesses? Uh, there's too many buffs required to make him work, and part of that is because of the mobility. When you have a character like this that can just pew, jettison across the battlefield, it means you have less chances to use buffs ahead of time. And so if you want him to use re-raise and courage and TMR, that's impossible. This dude is never going to get three buffs off before he's in range of the enemy. And that can also get into into trouble because kind of like Victor example, he's just going to Ooga Booga straight ahead with no teammate buffs on his kit and might open up to damage early on before other teammates can get in line. Now, he was also limited to slash type attacks. That's totally fine. Many characters are. His vision cards are tuned to give him the slash resistance penetration, but it is a mitigating factor to his damage upside. He does, in my opinion, have AP problems due to the buff cost where if he can only get one buff off before he's in range well if it's not a bells or an ap restoration tmr he's just going to end up basic attacking and then doing a small attack and basic attack and then a small attack and that's not efficient i also don't like the fact that his paladin sub is required to also get the courage if they're gonna roll him out and be like this dude's got two ways to survive a lethal hit i don't like the fact that you have to equip a sub job to make that happen because he's got two other sub jobs that never see the light of day because of it and at the end of the day, his survivability is relying on his health pool rather than any kind of defense or spirit either, which again, in 2022, many DPS have defense or spirit, so he's kind of lacking, but that's actually not the worst thing. Having a high health pool is not the worst thing. You just got to really cater to it. So let's look at what actually happened. His original, he actually really had some good ones here. It was HP 10% for himself and allies, earth attack for himself and allies, innate 20% slash resistance penetration, and the evasion rate of five. So what did they add for him? They upgraded the skill fake death, which is his re-raise, they gave him 20% attack and they gave him 20% HP. Now, in my opinion, this was again, another one for power creep, but it does slightly technically make him better at what he does because of the HP upgrade there, where that is a distinguishing characteristic of him as an evade unit compared to other evade units. His HP pool is way higher than other evade units. So that's definitely part of his strength that they're trying to make him do that even better. But I really think they whiffed on the fake death upgrade. So essentially when he revives, he gets an extra, it's, it's 200 CT, which is effectively, if you think of the bar, uh, CT bar is 100. It gives him 20 out of 100. That's bad in my opinion. That is not reliable at all. If it was 1000 CT to make sure that when he got re-raised, he would insta attack. I actually would like that. That's actually not so bad. But 20 out of 100 is way too unreliable to make sure that he like gets another turn before he dies again, before he gets hit by something. Just not a big fan of it overall. If I had to give him a grade, I'm actually going a D. It's not the worst one, but I don't think it significantly improves when you're going to use him. Admittedly, his weaknesses are by design. So there's limited ways to fix. His mobility is part of his kit and he's got very short range attacks. So the concept is that he has a high mobility so he can get behind the enemy to get those benefits of when he attacks enemies from behind. So I don't, I don't think there's a lot to change there. But I think it only marginally makes him better at what he does well. Now, what would I have liked to see personally? I would have reworked the, what they did for fake death buff. I think there's opportunities here that they missed out on. Now, number one, I, I think they should have also added courage to it. And that might seem broken to many of you that in one buff, he gets re-raise and courage. But you have to recall, that's the whole point of him. He's supposed to be hard to kill. Number two... There's a lot more access to dispel courage and dispel re-raise in the game on lots of characters. So when he was first released, this was almost broken. But nowadays, there's a lot more ways for people to dispel re-raise and dispel courage. So it's not as broken. But the biggest thing is now you don't have to equip the Paladin sub job, which I think is supremely limiting because there's not a lot of other abilities that he wants to use in the Paladin sub job. But now if you can lean into either his main sub 
or the Viking sub, now he's got some versatility in how you can build him. So I think that would open up more doors for him. And I do think increasing the TP cost would have been better just to allow him to generate a smidge more AP. Now I do think there's a secondary change, which actually may not be as drastic as this, but I think would still have some pretty good effect. I think if you were to have an added effect to this, where instead of the CT, if it was absorbed 30% damage done for three turns, and that's not unheard of. That's literally what Astrius is, is when he has his slash resistance up and he's a fellow 100 cost unit. If you want to lean into an evade unit that has a really high health pool and an earth element that has no real dedicated healers, I feel like this is a necessary part of it to add to that survivability where sure, you're going to have that high health pool and maybe he only has one re-raise or one courage, but at least he has a, a way to increase his health as the battle goes on as well. But that's my thoughts on the Mastery 2 abilities. I don't think it significantly changes either of them. I think most of us had high hopes, given that they're global exclusives, and it's the first time we've seen, you know, some of these global exclusive MA2s. I know Dwayne has one in JP technically, but Dwayne's kind of his own category of global exclusive in how old he is. Though you could make the same argument for Fryavi with how old she is. But overall, I, I would temper your expectations for what this does for them. And hopefully this at least changes the way you think about MA2s going forward in the future and how it categorizes and defines a character and how they've effectively made them better. Because at the end of the day, MA2s are supposed to make the character better. It's really just a question of how much. So that's it for now. Thank you for watching, everybody. I'll talk to you all soon.